let's kind of go back to the last couple chapters and what we've done and where we're going with it. In chapter six, you learned to maybe like find the area under, ooh, 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 let's do this, from here to here, right? So you started with maybe a trapezoid, right? Some of you maybe cut it into a triangle and a rectangle like that. We found the area of a trapezoid. And this would have been something like, you know, if you had an integral from maybe one to four, uh, x plus one dx. So this goes back to chapter six, okay? Where you took and you graphed this function and then you found the area. Because at that point, you did not know how to evaluate an integral. All right, then as the chapter went on a little further, you learned the fundamental theorem of calculus part one and part two, in which case you learned a different way to solve it, which was to find the antiderivative, adding one to the exponent, dividing by the new exponent. What's the antiderivative of, of one? X, and then you did top minus bottom, right? We chanted that, you know, that down, okay? So at first, you started out where you were just finding the area under a curve. You didn't know why you were finding the area under the curve, because that doesn't come till chapter 8, okay? But you first were finding the area, then you learned what if you have this, then you could find the antiderivative. So then from there, we went deeper in and we said, okay, well, what if you look from 0 to pi of sine x dx? And all of a sudden, that section was now a curved section. <laughs> all right, so we couldn't use an area anymore. We instead then said, all right, well, that's where we're going to start using antiderivatives. So what's the antiderivative of sine x? Negative cosine x. And then we still 0 to pi, top minus bottom. Negative cosine of pi minus and then negative cosine of zero, cosine of pi is negative one, right? And then that negative made it positive one. These two give me plus. Cosine of zero, what's that? One. One plus one is two, right? So we found what an area of a curved section was. But before we did that, didn't we even take and break it into the rectangles? We did the left rectangles, the right rectangles, right? We did all of those different things. Whatever the case, an integral every time represented the area under a curve. So then we went even further in and said, all right, what about if I have something like tangent x dx? Whatever it's from, 0 to pi, whatever numbers you have it, you know, that's fine. Okay. And you said, all right, well, I could draw it out from 0 to pi, but, ooh, it looks like it's kind of, there's an asymptote in there at pi over 2, and then it comes up like this over on this side. So from 0 to pi was like to there. And you physically looking at it, you could get the answer of 0 if you remembered what the graph was. But what about finding an antiderivative? Because at that point, your mind was all set for finding antiderivatives of these. You were way past the finding the area situation. In which case we said we don't know an antiderivative of tangent. So that's what chapter 7 was all about. What if you don't know the antiderivative of something? What can you do? Well, you could rewrite it as sine over cosine. And then we learned um, do substitution. And we learned integration by parts for anything that we didn't know an antiderivative for, okay? So I think some of you lost sight of where we came from and what an integral represented. An integral represents the area under the curve, okay? We did that, and then we found this antiderivative situation, and from there we forgot about what, what it even represented. And so then when we got to chapter 7 and we were doing something like, you know, different processes of how to find an antiderivative of something you didn't know the antiderivative for. That's what chapter 7 was all about. Okay, now what's chapter 8 about? Chapter 8, that's a few things, but it's about taking 
an area under a curve, finding it, rotating it around the x-axis, and getting now a three-dimensional solid. Okay? So, there is something that's kind of like this. If you rotate it around the x-axis, you now have this solid figure that you have to find the volume of. So area leads to volume. This is more section 8.3. We have to do 8.1 and 8.2 first, okay? So that's where we're going with it. So why is it important to find the area underneath a curve? Because that area is then going to get rotated and become a volume of something. So you have to be able to look at a figure like that and figure out how I'm going to rotate it around, you know, the x-axis, and then what figure am I actually getting? And so you'll be thinking of things when we get to that. You'll be thinking of things like maybe the lampshade at home. Maybe it's a vase that you have. Maybe it's a bell. <laughs> you know, I mean, it could be different things. And that's where the engineering piece comes in is when someone is trying to, say, make this cup, which is a very easy one. But if someone was trying to design this cup right here, it's just a cylinder with a handle on it. But anybody have a water bottle handy? That's not a cylinder. That's kind of, okay, there you go. Yep. Zach has that. See how the top of it, you know, the bottom of it is a cylinder. So for his, could you take and draw that there's the bottom, there's, comes up like this, and then it goes like this. If you rotate it then around the x-axis, you would then get that bottle. So it's having you take and break things apart in your mind, and can you take and draw them, okay? That's where it starts moving into, like, the engineering idea or the idea of, of um, creating something, okay? So hopefully then you'll be able to take and look at different containers and such and say, okay, well, what was needed for that? Well, it's not circular. Instead, it has more square sorts of, you know, sizes to it. So then we'll talk about that as well, okay? And how there'll be cross sections that are squares of it, okay? Or what about this trash can? Right, right. I mean, everything that's around you, anything that's plastic that's around you is pretty much designed in this way. You know, could you take and figure out how to design it? Okay, and then from there, come out with like the negative effect of it so that then someone could pour liquid plastic down into it and then pop out a trash can. Okay. I was fortunate in that when I, when I was growing up, my dad owned a company um, that <coughs> made the molds for plastic things like that. So I was able to go in and see you know, the different, like, AutoCAD programs that they were using. Eventually, originally, they were all by hand, but then eventually the computers came out. But they would have these big, huge drafting boards that they would have to draw these things all by hand and try to figure out how to make them. So I guess I kind of look at the world around me a little bit differently because I, you know, grew up seeing, like, how my Fisher-Price toys were made and how my Hoover Sweeper was made and, you know, all those different things that, you know, have plastic parts, the dashboard in your car, you know, like all that sort of stuff is all, you know, plastic. Anything that's plastic is made in that way. Okay. So that's where we're headed with it, but you can't lose sight from where we came from. Okay. An integral <coughs> is the area under a curve. Okay. So, not only is it that, but if you think about um, way back when we had a train problem, a train was going at the same speed from this time to this time, and then we found that area, right? So we applied that integral to this right here. This could have been, I think it was from a time of five to seven, from a time of 5 to 7, and then this here, the train was going 75 miles per hour. We had already done that problem before. We had something like this. So you could find the antiderivative, 75x, evaluated from 5 to 7, top minus bottom, and then you ended up with the distance. Okay, so 
let's think about this. This was miles per hour. This is hours. So when we do this, when we take this right here and we're taking this piece that's miles per hour and we're looking at it from a certain time, from a certain hour to a certain hour, the miles per hour and the hour cancel with each other and gave us how many miles we actually went. Okay, again, an application problem to the integral. But that's how we start today with linear motion revisited. How is it that we can relate integrals to this linear motion? Because isn't this kind of linear motion right here? He was going a certain speed from this time to this time, and in the end it gave us what his total distance was. So could I take an acceleration and integrate it and from there get a velocity? Or could I integrate a velocity and in turn get the distance traveled? Okay, so I know chapter seven, you know, might have thrown some of you as far as, you know, where is this being applied? But it's the skill behind being able to solve the application problems. Okay. So we will talk about linear motion revisited, which we've talked about velocity acceleration before. You know, it's going to come back up again, but we're going to be given it in, in the backwards order. We're not going to know the, um, the position function. We're going to have to find the position function, which you've had to already before, but this time with integrals. Then we're going <coughs> to talk about, and I, this is a two-day lesson, so I don't know exactly how far I'll get today through it, but also consumption over time. There's a potato problem, okay? Uh, you might not think of potatoes very often, but a potato farmer surely would think about potatoes. And they know how, you know, at what rate their potatoes are growing. Could you find out how many potatoes there were in the end if you looked at a certain amount of time? And yes, you can. And do you think people do that that are farmers? Absolutely. Like, that is how they survive. That is their living. That's their job, okay? Does our country look at it as well? Absolutely. Because we don't want to export things that maybe we need here in the United States. So if we have a drought and so we maybe not enough potatoes, and it, uh, you, could, you could put anything in, in place of that word potatoes there, okay? But if not enough potatoes were grown in a given year, then we would not want to export them to another country if we need them here in our country, okay? And so many times our government will help farmers out to say, hey, we need more of this, and then from there, and, and actually, what, did you, what have you seen most recently with what the government is trying to control someone growing? What is it? You got it. Okay, marijuana. There you have it. Medical marijuana. So, you know, why is that? Well, because they're trying to control it so that it's not, you know, like a black market. So it's not, you know, like there, there's a lot of other things that go into it besides just, you know, being medical marijuana. You know, are there farmers that have stepped forward to say, we'll grow it? You know, and yeah, because there's going to be a big market for it because now all of a sudden, it became legal, you know, medical marijuana, legal medical marijuana, okay, in our state. Is our state different than other states? Is it different if you go to Colorado? Oh, yes, it is. Okay, so, and, and that's based on the different states. So, you know, the government's saying, hey, we need this much marijuana. How, you know, who's going to grow it for us? You know, so it's, it's on anything. And our government very much keeps an eye on what things are grown and how much there are being grown. And if not enough is being grown of any particular thing, carrots, I don't know, it doesn't matter what it is you're talking about, okay? If not enough is being grown, then they're gonna try to talk to some farmers and say, hey, we'll subsidize this for you. We'll pay for part of this for you. We'll, we won't make you pay taxes this year if you grow this for us. You know, and, and those are deals that you don't see that are being made. Okay, not unless you look into it. I mean, it's out there. If you want to look into it, you certainly can. So consumption over time is how much we consume of something. We are consumers, okay? We consume a lot of stuff. 
Do we consume? Do we consume shampoo? Do you shampoo? Then we consume it. Consume doesn't mean you have to eat it. Okay. I know a lot of times people think that, but consume means do we use it, and do we use it up? You know. What about wool off of sheep? Do we consume it? Clothing. You know. <laughs> Or, you know, a sleeping bag or whatever. I mean, a blanket, whatever it happens to be. Everything that you go to the store and buy, you consume. Okay? Most of what we buy, we consume pretty rapidly sometimes. And then that causes a problem for our environment, right? Where are our Jags people, right? That then causes problems for our environment at the rates at which we consume things, especially if they're packaged in plastic. Or it used to be a big problem with paper, and now it's turned really to plastic. The paper's better than plastic, but at one point it was we're losing all of our trees, and we're losing all. You know, well now we make sure and we try to plant as many trees as we cut down to, you know, recuperate that. But what if we didn't? You know, well then we really have problems. Okay, so understanding, you know, consumption doesn't just mean eating something. Okay. All right, so here we go. Example of a linear motion problem, and this is revisited because we have talked about this before. Velocity, V of t, equals 10 minus 2t is the velocity in meters per second of a particle moving along the x-axis. Now, I would tell you right now that when I read a problem like this, as soon as I see a label in the problem, I do tend to underline it because when I'm asked questions later on, then I don't have to go look for it. Because it's not always written so clearly as that. Sometimes it'll say t is in seconds, you know, um, um, s is in feet, you know, whatever it happens to be. Sometimes they're separated, but I do find myself underlining them to make sure I don't have to go back and search. So it's, bless you, moving along an x-axis from a time, bless you, of zero to, uh, to nine. Another thing I'll warn you about with these linear motion problems, you cannot have a negative time. So there have been a couple of times way back when, when we saw this before, that some of you found the antiderivative and then you came out with a negative time and you gave that as your answer. Some of you picked up on it that you couldn't have a negative time and you said so. So make sure if your answer would ever come out on one of these like at a time of negative two, you can't have a negative time. So it'd be ne never for the answer for that, if that, whatever the case, whatever the question is. It says use analytic methods, that means not your calculator, to determine when the particle is moving to the right, to the left, and stopped. Right? Well, velocity, remember, is the derivative of the position function. So you might remember your number line, first derivative number line test. Right? You took the derivative, you set it equal to zero. Well, we're given the derivative. It's 10 minus 2t. Set it equal to 0. I would add the 2t to both sides. So a little bit of algebra here. At a time of 5, it is stopped. That's what I just found. When I set the velocity equal to 0, it's saying where is the slope 0 of the original function, and that tells me when the object stopped or change directions, because in order to change directions, it has to stop, okay? I then go to my number line, and I say, well, here's five. So make sure you put the ending numbers as well. We were told here that the time goes from zero to nine, okay? If it just says for a time greater than zero, you could have a zero on this side, but you wouldn't have anything over on this side at all. Okay, then from there we do our number line test. Remember, this is the first derivative. I pick a number in here, like maybe one. I changed colors, notice. Remember, we talked about that earlier. Pick a number in here, maybe six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. And then I go back to this function, which is the derivative, and I plug it in. 10 minus 2 is 8, which means positive. Plug a 6 in. 10 minus 12 negative 2, right? So it's negative. Wherever it's positive, it's moving to the right. Wherever it's negative, it's moving to the left. So we say that the object is moving to the right 
Now you can say from a time of 0 to 5, or you could say from a time of 0 to 5. Okay. Now what about the equal signs? It doesn't matter. You can have them or not. Okay. Same with this. It could be 0 to 5 like this. They're not going to mark off for the ending points counting or not counting. Okay, so you don't have to worry. It's moving to the left when? From a time of 5 to 9. So say I put it like that. You know, whatever, whatever way you put it, that's fine. Okay, as long as you're including those numbers. So that's moving to the left, moving to the right. Okay, then it says... Find the particle's displacement for the given time interval. The displacement is how far is it from where it started. Okay. In order to tell where it started, you'd have to have its position function, and you don't have its position function. So whenever they start talking about where it is, or how far it has traveled, you need to know something about the position function. Which means you can't use the velocity, you need the position. But how can I come up with that? I could write it as an integral. Because if I set this up as an integral, I'm going to set it up down here just so that then I can move it up and have a little more space. If I set it up as an integral, they first of all set on the given time interval. So that's from 0 to 9. And then the velocity right here, 10 minus 2t dt. To solve this means I'm finding the antiderivative, which means I'm finding the position function. Okay? And then the given time from a time of 0 to 9 is going to tell me, this right here actually gives me the displacement. It does not give me the total distance traveled. Okay? It gives me displacement. How far it is from 0 to 9. So it's going to take into consideration where was it at a time of 0, where is it at a time of 9, and it's going to find the difference of those. Okay? So watch this. If we find the antiderivative of this, we get 10t minus t squared. Everybody agree? This that you just found is the position function. Okay? When we say from 0 to 9, we're saying take where it is when we do f of 9 minus f of 0, which is your, you know, fundamental theorem of calculus part 2. You're finding the antiderivative and plugging them in. When you do this right here, you're saying where was it at a time of 9? Where was it at a time of 0? Let's take the difference of the two. Okay? And finding that displacement. So plugging a 9 in, here's our top minus bottom situation. Plugging the 9 in, I get 90 minus 81. Plugging the 0 in, I get 0. So I get 9 minus 0. This is saying it was at 9 at a time of 9. And it's at 0 at a time of 0. So it has traveled 9. Now I'm going to have to label this. Okay. Now think about the one I talked about a little bit ago with the 75 miles per hour. And then these were hours. Oops, it was 7 at the top. These labels here will cancel with, with this denominator, giving me miles. So what do I have here? These are, was it meters per second? Is that right? Meters per second? These are seconds. This is meters per second. That label is going to cancel with that, giving me how many meters? It, is from where it started. It's nine meters from where it started. I should put this so you don't think it's minutes or miles or anything. Okay. So that's where this section starts out with, you know, more types of word problems and application problems where you're going to take a look at these things right here, you know, the labels themselves. So if you're reading an actual like extended response question from AP and you don't know where to start, look at the labels. If they're giving you a rate, like miles per hour, and the question is asking you for miles, well, that means you're going to integrate it 
you're going to put the hours at the top and bottom so that it cancels with the miles per hour hours part of that, leaving you then with the miles. So understanding the labels on these and that these things reduce makes it very helpful with solving some of the word problems that are yet to come. Okay, so that is part B. Any questions so far on that one? Okay, part C says, if S of zero equals three, this is saying, S is referring to what? The position function. It's saying at a time of zero, if the particle starting at three instead of at zero, if it starts at three, what is the particle's final position? If it's starting at 3, how far did it travel during that time? 9 meters. That means it's going to end at 12. So this is something here that they are going to try to trick you on. In the wording, they're going to say, hey, this thing's starting at 5, and you're not going to know what to do with that. And so you have to remember at the end to go back and add it on which I'll show you another you know, way to do it, when, depending on how the problems are worded. Now, part D has the words total distance. So hopefully you're seeing that each of these is asking a different question. Displacement and total distance are not the same. And we talked about that earlier in there when we talked about uh, total distance. If this is my remote, it's starting right here, right above where my notebook is, okay? And it moves to the right, and then it moves to the left, and then it moves to the right, and it moves to the left. Displacement is from where it started to here. But total distance travel, I would have to take this, plus this, plus this, plus that. I'd have to take all the distances. So think about what we found earlier in this problem. The object moved to the right for five seconds. Then it moved to the left. So its displacement was nine from where it started, but its total distance, I now have to break it up and look at different integrals. I need to say, all right, how far did it travel from a, Z, a time of zero to five? So here's where I start breaking it down into where did it stop and change directions. And then also I have to add on from 5 to 9. The problem is, is this integral is going to end up being negative because it's moving to the left. And so I'm going to have to change it to positive to say, if I want the total distance, and we're talking distance here, I can't count the negative in. The negative just gave me direction. It didn't really give me distance, per se. It just gave me where it was going. So for this right here, I'm just going to say 10 minus 2t dt. I'm going to fill these in now. 10 minus 2t dt. Again, this is revisited. We have talked about this before. Do you remember it? Well, who knows, okay? It depends on if you memorized it when you learned it before, then you don't even remember seeing it. Okay. All right, from here, we need the antiderivative again. Don't we already know it? 10t minus t squared. Evaluated from 0 to 5. And then over here, 10t minus t squared. Evaluated from 5 to 9. Okay. So for this one here, top minus bottom. My bottom each time is going to be 0 for this one. Not for this one, though. Because the bottom number is not 0. So here when I plug the 5 in, I get 50 minus 25 minus 0. So this one I get 25. It moved to the right 25 meters in that first 5 seconds. And then over here, I need top minus bottom. Okay, save yourself some work. You all paying attention? I plugged a 5 in there and got that answer. I'm going to plug a 5 in for here. It's going to be that same answer. Don't redo the work twice. 
You have no idea how many times people will do the work, get it right once, and then do it again, not get it right the next time. You know, just steal that answer. As long as you're right the first time, you're good. But if you're wrong the first time, it's not so good. Now, I still have to plug the 9 in. Well, didn't I plug the 9 in over here? You know, and the answer came out to 9. So you can save yourself some work if you recognize that you already did that over in those two pieces in the problem. Well, 9 minus 25 is negative 16, which we knew it was going to come out to be negative because it's moving to the left. I need the absolute value of it. So I have 25 plus 16, which is 41 meters. So the object started out moving to the right 25 meters and then moving to the left 16 meters. Its total distance is 41. Its displacement is only 9 meters from where it started. Okay, so make sure you know the difference between this. Again, we talked about it before. You've seen this before. This is just revisited with you. Now, does anybody remember if you were allowed to use your calculator, what could you do that's even shorter on this problem? If you're allowed to use your calculator, something else that you could do. Yeah. Take that for the value of the Got it. Nailed it. Okay. Let me use the color. If you're allowed to use your calculator, you could have said from 0 to 9 of whatever that V of T was, but you just need absolute values around it. Again, that's revisited. We already talked about that. Okay. So, most of the time you can't use your calculator. However, sometimes they'll say they don't want you to solve it and they just have an answer, you know, multiple choice, and you pick an answer choice like that. Where you put the absolute values makes a difference, okay? You cannot put them on the outside from 0 to 9 because that would give you 9 and then you absolute value of 9. That's that answer, but absolute values around it. The absolute value has to go in around the function. Okay. And why is that? Let me give you a picture of what it does. That 10 minus 2t oops, is a graph of a line that crosses the y-axis up at 10. It goes down 2 and, or down two and to the right one. It has a slope of um, negative 2. Down to the right one, down to the right one, down to the right one, down to the right one. I'm trying to hit the x-axis at the right spot. Anyways, it comes down like this. It hits the x-axis here at a time of 5. Do you see how some of the area is positive and how some of the area is negative? Okay. What the absolute value does is it takes this part that's below the x-axis, moves it above the x-axis, so all the area you're finding is all above the x-axis. Again, those are things, this whole slide, everything on this slide, we have talked about before, but we did not set it up with an integral sign. Okay. Potato, I told you there's a potato problem. Potato consumption. From 1970 to 1980, the rate of potato consumption in a particular country was C of T equals 2.2 plus 1.1 to the T millions of bushels per year. Who can describe a bushel? It's a measurement. Who can describe a bushel? Anybody know? A bushel basket? Have you ever heard of a bushel basket? All right. So if you're a farmer, you know what a bushel is because that's how they talk about things. But it's a basket that's like that big, that big, a bushel. Um, I like to think of sometimes people will use them outside of their houses as a decoration. We'll have one of like those wooden baskets. Sometimes they lay it on their side and have flowers coming out of it. I don't know if you've seen that before. But a bushel is, you know, like about that big. Okay. 
So millions, that many millions, that's exponential right there, that number that you see, okay? A T being in years, so I'm gonna mark this for later, um, since the beginning of 1970. How many bushels were consumed from the beginning of 1972 to the end of 1975? In other words, for all of 72, 73, 74, 75, the whole years, okay? Now notice this says the beginning of 1970. That means how many years past 1970 is this? Two. How many years past, this says to the end of 1975, means through that 75th year right there. So, 70, wait, I want to make sure there's one thing on that one. That's what I thought. The end of 1975. Isn't that the beginning of 1976? Like the end of that? So this here would actually be at a time of six because of how it's saying the end of the year. It's not the beginning of the year. So here's what we have. If we have that this is two, and this is in years, to six years, and we have this is 2.2 plus 1.1 to the T millions of bushels per year. Normally we don't write the labels in, but I want to bring your attention to the labels. Do you see that this year here and this year here are going to cancel, giving us then millions of bushels? It's going to give us a quantity. So we can integrate this if we're given a rate and we're given the time, we can integrate it to find how many of something occurs, you know, whether it's miles, whether in the last problem it was meters, in this problem it's millions of bushels. Okay. How many bushels were consumed from the beginning um, of 1972 to the end of 1975? So there's your question. Do you know the antiderivative of these things? What's the antiderivative of 2.2? 2.2t. What's the antiderivative of 1.1 to the t? You know it? Do you know the derivative of it? Because if you know the derivative, I'll be able to easily show you the antiderivative. What's the derivative of 1.1 to the t? What's the derivative? Nope. It's exponential. The one that you're, you're, you're used to seeing is like this. Like 2 to the n. Okay? Different letters and a decimal. So it looks different. So what's the derivative of 2 to the... 2 to the n, or 2 to the x even. You want an x instead? You don't like n? Here we go. What's the derivative of 2 to the x? 2 to the x, ln 2. Uh -oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> we don't know our derivatives. We're not going to know the antiderivatives, right? Okay, so now you're ready for the antiderivative. The antiderivative of 2 to the x is 2 to the x, same thing that it is, but instead of multiplying by natural log of 2, you're dividing by natural log of 2. That one doesn't come up very often. Certainly didn't come up much in the last chapter because, you know, you're supposed to know that antiderivative. I was giving you things you didn't know an antiderivative for. Okay? So now let's do it with the 1.1. What's the antiderivative of 1.1? Divided by natural log of 1.1. You know how with like chain rule, if you have something like e to the 2x, the derivative is e to the 2x times 2, right? But the antiderivative is e to the 2x divided by 2. So instead of multiplying, you're dividing because you're going in the opposite direction, right? That's exactly what's happening on this one right here. 
All right, so if you didn't know that derivative, you might want to go back and look over some of your derivatives because I know like your inverse, you know, tangent, secant, like all of those kind of get rusty. You know, uh, your polynomials are great. You know, that's not the problem. It's all the extra ones, all right? Evaluated from a time of two to six. And then from here, top minus bottom. Plugging the top number in, I have 2.2 times 6. And then I have this, which I don't know that off the top of my head. I don't know the natural log of 1.1. Okay, so this would be a calculator problem to, to get that part. So let's see, 1.1 to the sixth power, and then divided by natural log of 1.1, gives me 18.587 dot dot dot. And I have to plug the two in, 2.2 .2 times two, 4.4, and then 1.1 to the second power, divided by natural log of 1.1, and I get 12.695 dot, dot, dot for that. I can't use those decimals. I have to use the big, long thing. And so then from here, 13.2 plus that guy right up there. And then these are both subtracted. Minus 4.4 minus that last guy. I end up getting 14.692 millions of bushels. Okay, that's a lot of bushels of potatoes. That's a lot of potatoes, right? But that is, and they didn't even say which country that was. That was only one country. That wasn't every country, that was one country. And they didn't say the United States, so it must not have been the United States, or I think they would have said it, you know? When they write a textbook, they actually do go and find you know, exact information. So that is true about one country. All right, I think that's a good stopping place for today, right there. We'll pick up tomorrow from that point.